How many of you are familiar with Model My Watershed? Okay, so about half of you. All right. So it's a, it's a big application, and I can't go through it all today. So if you feel like I'm skimming over some stuff, I really encourage you to take one of the business cards that's up on top of the table here, or also by the continuing ed sign-in sheet. It's got the web URL that'll take you straight to this application. It's free. There are free online tutorial documents to guide you through, but really the best way to learn this application is just to sort of play with it. It's very user-friendly, lots of drop-down windows, as you'll see, um, and don't be um, intimidated by what uh, I might skip over today in particular. So we've been presenting um, at this Watershed Congress for several years now on Model My Watershed because this is a project that is specifically um, designed to help the lay public learn about their watershed. Um, it was originally conceptualized actually as an educational tool for the K through 12 curriculum and then developed into a professional grade model, which is what I'm going to focus on today is the more professional grade applications. Um, it uh, has a long history of development. The Stroud Water Research Center has been the lead organization in developing this, but we are by no means the only people involved. As you can see here, lots of university folks doing some really high level work that's totally under the hood here um, that we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of too much today, but there's a lot of power behind this model and a lot of powerful brains behind this model in addition to ours. And, um, including Millersville University uh, with some of the outreach components and the curriculum design components. It's been funded by a number of sources, but our primary source of, re of uh, financial backing has been from the National Science Foundation and the William Penn Foundation, um, as well as several other smaller sources of money. But William Penn Foundation is very, very interested in building useful tools that can be put into the hands of the people of the Delaware River Basin to better manage their watershed, better target restoration dollars, conceptualize better river restoration and watershed restoration projects that are actually going to go straight to the root of the problem. And in order to do that, you really have to understand and be able to identify what that problem is in the first place. And that's what this tool, this application is really designed to do. So what does it do? Really briefly, this is the Model My Watershed conceptualized into two slides. We take lots of federal, national level databases that are ordinarily very difficult for the average person to access. We usually require advanced uh, college level degrees and geographic information systems to really utilize. We distill those land cover data sets soil data sets, uh, the, the stream network data set for the entire country, and we package it into this model that's, that's just a click um, and a, a menu selection away from, from people being able to manipulate, use, and visualize this information. So it's designed to take these really complicated data sets, bring it down to the, to the point where my 10-year-old can open this and in five minutes be functionally using it. And if that's possible, really the, the sky's the limit in terms of, of more educated folks that are interested in watershed management being able to use it in, in a really powerful way. There's two models embedded in Model My Watershed. The first one we call our site storm model. It's a basic model. It's built off of USGS hydrologic model, so it's not that basic. But it basically just takes a storm event and applies it over a 24-hour period and tells you what's going to happen in an area of interest, a watershed, a parcel of land, whatever your area of interest you've selected. It gives you some basic water quality information using the EPA Step L model. Um, and this is the part that I'm not going to cover today. This was the first generation Model My Watershed application, and it's mostly used now as an educational tool. It's a real model, though, but it's a basic model. Today I'm going to focus on what we call our watershed multi-year model, which is a regulatory level professional grade water quality and hydrology model that's now embedded in Model My Watershed. And this is where the real power is. And this is where watershed groups and organizations, uh, even in engineering firms, can utilize this model to um, assess impacts on a particular area of land use change decisions, so like things like uh, zoning changes, what that might do to the watershed, 
but also to evaluate best management practices and river restoration proposals to figure out exactly what the impact might be over time. It's a lot more complicated than this model. It takes, um, it uses a bunch of historical data sets of precipitation and other climate variables, combines them with land cover and all these other variables, and runs a complicated year-long model and gives you output on a yearly basis as opposed to just a 24-hour time period. Okay, so a lot more processing involved here. And, but both of them do allow you to manipulate a watershed or an area of interest and game different scenarios. What happens if Pottstown treats all its uh, urban stormwater generated by building infiltration basins, for example? You can answer that question using this model. Um, the recent additions, the new parts, really focus on the multi-year watershed model, and that's why I'm going to focus on that today. Um, some of the latest and greatest things is we've really beefed up the power and the, the data richness in terms of precipitation inputs and the temperature inputs, so the climate drivers that determine how much water um, ends up being runoff versus evapotranspiration, loss back to the atmosphere, for example. And it's um, now feeding not just regional data sets, but national data sets on things like um, hydrology variables and nutrient concentrations. So for example, the model now draws, the multi-year watershed model now draws on USGS base flow estimates nationwide. Um, and I should have said from the very beginning, this model works everywhere in the United States, the lower 48. No Hawaii, no Alaska, sorry. But everywhere else it works. Um, the one exception would be areas where there's extensive snow cover or ice fields, high up in the mountains. Not going to work very well for you. But everywhere else it works very well. Um, so we pull on USGS base flow estimates. We also pull on national groundwater nitrogen data um, and national data sets of that na nature, soil phosphorus estimates, which are based on soil types. The soil nitrogen estimates also, this is largely driven by a combination of soil type and land cover. Um, I mentioned the more advanced climate data. Um, there's something called PRISM, which uses radar imagery to generate very detailed uh, precipitation estimates. Those are now being um, accessed. And here's an example of the drop-down nature of the model. For those of you that are not familiar with the, the visualization of it, um, there's a, a menu bar over here. You just click on things, and you can expand and see the scale that's represented in the map, for example. Um, this is showing the monthly precipitation for the United States. And here is the mean temperature for December. And you could click on that dot and drag it back and forth, and you would change the month you were looking at and visualizing. So it's very user-friendly, very easy, uh, low barrier of entry kind of information. And again, you can look at the scale to see what the colors mean in terms of actual temperature in Celsius at this point. Um, we've also really improved the, the um, climatic data input into the model. This was the original conceptualization of the model. It was drawing on a basic network of weather stations across the United States. And the right shows you the current network of, of weather stations that we're pulling on. So we have much better uh, finer resolution information going into the model, which makes a better model output in the long run. So a little bit of background about what that multi-year model is based on. Um, some of you that may have worked in the regulatory environment might be familiar with a model called MapSheds. It was developed by Barry Evans uh, when he was at Penn State, and he continues to work on it, and he's one of our collaborators. And what we've done is basically pulled that model into Model My Watershed as the multi-year model. MapSheds is a very detailed desktop type application, or program really, um, and it's going away because of uh, some software obsolescence. And so rather than recreate it in a new desktop application, the decision was made to pull it in and model my watershed as a new home for map sheds and we'll sustain it into the future. Um, it's a GIS or geographic information systems based model. So we have very spatial, obviously. Um, and it's based on a model called GWLFE, which is a generalized watershed loading function model. And what that means is it takes a chunk of your watershed, looks at the land cover, looks at the soils, looks at the slopes, um, makes some guesstimates about the number of animals that might be on that land cover, and a few other estimates based on lots of, of information, and then applies a load of pollutants in terms of sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus 
to the water that comes off of that chunk of land. Right? And then it does that for every chunk of land in your area of interest, for example, your watershed that you selected. And it spits it out at the bottom. What's the net yield coming out of that area based on that loading function model? So again, it takes a parcel of water and attaches the pollutant load to it and then pushes it off uh, down the network. Um, this is also the same framework that's used in the EPA basins model, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, MapShed still exists. I don't want you to you think it's dead yet, but it's going to die soon. <laughs> so if you are a MapShed user, it's time to start thinking about becoming familiar with Model My Watershed um, because that's the, the next home that it's going to be, basically. And like I said, Barry Evans is still very much involved, even though he's retired from Penn State. Um, he's watching his baby continue to grow. Um, this is a little bit on the technical side, but just so you know how it goes, um, the, the program takes those GIS information layers, so land cover, soil type, slope, um, the stream network, these are all stacked together, if you will, in the GIS framework. And then again, the, that load of pollutants is attached to the water that's produced off of there. So it's a combination of a hydrologic model producing the water, and then the loading being added to that. Um, in MapSheds itself, you had to construct input files that, that told the, the program specifically about certain attributes of your watershed. That's no longer the case with Model My Watershed. It's, it's all GIS based. It's all taking it derived from the land cover. Although we are working on making it customizable, it's not available yet. One of the most important parts of the MapSheds model and now Model My Watershed multi-year model is that it's also a BMP simulator. So you can take a best management practice like fencing animals out of a stream and overlay that again on the stack of information and it modifies the pollutant load that's attached to the water leaving that system. And so that enables you to again game your area of interest or game your watershed and say under scenario A if we convince every farmer to, to fence their cattle or horses out of the streams this is how much sediment we can remove from the pollutant loading. This is how much phosphorus that goes with that sediment that we can eliminate from the pollution loading, et cetera. So very, very important part of the model that is very much alive in Model My Watershed. And then finally, you get real quantitative output. You get numbers. You also get maps. Um, and you can export those into Excel files. You can take screenshots of the visuals that are produced in the model. And you can include those in proposals for funding for restoration, proposals for programming um, to, for example, incentivize farmers to fence out their livestock from the stream, et cetera. So it's, a, it's designed to be useful and to provide that information. This is what MapSheds looks like as a desktop program. And again, it was it's a little on the, it's actually a very easy program to use, but it's a little intimidating to look at especially for someone who's not used to using quantitative models or watershed models. Um, so this um, is a highly detailed model with lots of opportunities to input data and customize it so it's exactly like the watershed you're trying to model. For example, if I know how many um, sheep there are in my watershed, I can put in that there are 70 sheep in my watershed. I know that. There's no need to estimate from the land cover. But Again, this is a lot of data input. It's a, a barrier to access, a barrier to use, a barrier to um, adoption by the public. And it's great, but now we've embedded all of this into Model My Watershed, and you no longer have these tables to fill out. And instead, it's a much more user-friendly format. And that's what I want to show you now, is I'm going to go through a screen captured demo. This isn't a live demo. But when I finish, um, I probably will have time, and I'm more than happy to show you the live model and to run through it in real time um, as well. And this presentation will be available, so this is also a good guide um, mm -hmm. for folks that want to explore it later on. I'm not sure how they'll access that, but talk to the Watershed Congress organizers and you'll be able to get to it. So Model My Watershed is one of many uh, things that the Stroud Water Research Center provides for free to the public. And it's accessed through what we call our Wiki Watershed website, um, a, a series of watershed tools that we produce and are available to watershed groups or just any, any person who wants to use them. So it's, you go to wikiwatershed.org, and again, the website is on this card here. You would click on the Launch the App 
under Model My Watershed, right here. And that takes you to the entry point for Model My Watershed. And there's a Get Started button. You would click on that. It'll initially show you the United States. It might ask you, your computer might ask you to allow permission to, to locate yourself or the, to identify your specific location. If you do that, it'll zoom right into where you happen to be sitting from the, the bigger United States view. And just for curiosity's sake, you're looking at the National Land Cover data set. So this is the land cover of the United States. It's a data set produced by um, the federal government, and it's uh, revised every 10 years. So it's fairly accurate um, representation of, of the area. So um, for example, I had you know, allowed my computer to identify my location. I live near Kenneth Square, down in Chester County, and then it zoomed right in. And I still haven't clicked the Get Started button, but once I do, then um, this kind of screen comes up. And you're now actually in the model. And I had input in the space up here. It says Jump to Location, or HUC. HUC is a hydrologic unit code, otherwise known as a watershed. But that's what the USGS likes to call them. They're HUCs. Hopefully there's no USGS folks in here. Yeah. OK, good. Um, I love the USGS, but again, not, not everything's designed to be readily consumed by the public. So I put in Potsdam PA, and it zooms right in to Potsdam. And then there's a couple of options here to, to tell the model where you're interested in analyzing, where, where your area of interest is. The first one is to select a, a boundary. These are preset boundaries. We have the counties, we have school districts, we have some municipalities, um, and we have three sizes of hydrologic unit code or watershed. Um, and those are generated again by the USGS. Here's an example of the map showing all the different HUC 12 level watersheds, which as the number gets bigger, the watershed size gets smaller. Again, <laughs> love the USGS. Um, so uh, we're still, it's the same view, Potsdam's right here, but you can see all these little micro watersheds. These are probably little um, first and second order streams, maybe third order streams, right? But that's great if you only are interested in a very small area. Um, you can also draw your own area. So if you want to, are interested in a parcel of land, a piece of property, including like your own yard, basically, you can zoom right in and you can draw the boundaries of your property line and it'll select that as an area of interest. You can just randomly grab an area and it'll select that as well. Um, you can delineate a watershed, which I'll show you in a minute, and, um, or you can also upload a file. So if you're our GIS literate or have a friend who is, and you can get a GIS image file, um, a shape file that delineates an area, you can upload that and it'll, it'll utilize that too. Yes? All right, thank you. So the idea of being able to draw the, the area that you want to, yes. it to calculate for you is very interesting, but I imagine that drawing process might be a little imprecise. Is there a way to put in um, actual coordinates in? So um, you maybe you have the coordinates from an actual tax parcel, for example, or right. a deed or something. Could you input that? You would, you would need a polygon, so a shape of some kind. So if, for example, you went to um, the county database and looked up parcel maps that way, and if they, were, if they served up the, the polygons that delineated that parcel, you could do that. But a coordinate itself would just zoom you into that location. It wouldn't identify an area. So you could type in a geographic coordinate up there in the location box, and it'll take you right to it. But it won't delineate an area of interest. Um, you are, I can show you afterwards, but if you, um, you can visualize the satellite imagery and you can zoom pretty far in. Like, uh, you know, I have a 1.8 acre lot and it's very easy to draw right around the edges of it, pretty precisely. Could you repeat, how do you get the parcel map from the county? Well, I shouldn't <laughs> offer up the county data. Okay. Counties vary. Um, sometimes you can get an actual shape file of a piece of, of property. So shapefile is, is the, the GIS file that closes the loop around an area of interest. So it's a line that's connected. So you have to find that somewhere else and yes. report it. Yes, yes, okay. that's right. Or like I said, you can do your best and draw it on your own as well. Okay. Because you have an aerial view, you, you can use the clues of where mm -hmm. the road is. Yeah. Yep, yep. 
Um, the next size up, the next number down in Hux is a Hux 10 level. And here you see again, the watersheds got bigger. The red lines are the watershed boundaries. And you can go up. The largest size we offer is um, the Huck 8, which is, in this case, the entire Schuylkill River watershed. Okay, um, the Schuylkill's not that big. <laughs> uh, they, vary, they vary in spatial size somewhat at this level. Um, the, the bigger your area of interest, the longer it takes to crank and actually process the data, but it's still very quick. We're talking maybe difference between three seconds and 15 seconds. So, you know, we all have that much patience. Once you do, I uh, select an area. So what I did, I had overlaid all the Hug8 basins. I clicked on the one that we're sitting in right now, and it's shaded everything else out and selected the one that I clicked on, okay? And again, it's just a cursor click right on top of that area. And immediately it spits out some basic information. It tells us the land cover distribution in that watershed I've selected. It's not visualized right now, but you could easily turn that on using this layers box down here. Um, the first one has to do with the stream resolutions, which none of them are highlighted, so you don't see a stream network highlighted right now, but you could easily pick one of those. This grid box is those big national GIS layers, so land cover, soil type, uh, et cetera. And uh, the other ones also, this thing that looks like a Wi-Fi signal is actually point observations. So if I clicked on that, it would show you where all the USGS gauges were, for example, and any other points of data availability that have been connected up to um, the model. <coughs> and again, in the Delaware River Basin, that's a very rich data set because of the William Penn Foundation's investment in the DRB. Outside of the DRB, it's just the USGS network that we've added. So here's an example showing um, the stream layer identified. And I just wanted to show you how you would delineate a watershed if you wanted to, because a lot of us are involved in stream monitoring and we might be volunteer stream monitors or we don't have our favorite fishing spot or whatever the case might be. If you know where that is on the map, you can click delineate a watershed, go over there with your cursor, identify the area of stream that you are interested in, click on it, and it will automatically delineate the watershed draining to that point. Okay. Now this, this is actually pretty cool. I'm a hydrologist, a geomorphologist. Um, I used to have to hand draw watersheds <laughs> when I was in school. You know, I mean, it's like, wow, this is so easy now. Um, and it's, it's a pretty powerful tool to be able to really quickly identify everything that's draining to that stream reach that you're trying to understand what's going on in, okay? So it's a very, very cool tool. And that way you're not dependent on how the USGS decided to size up its watersheds, its huck levels. Um, and uh, we work with a bunch of watershed groups where we were installing stream gauges of our own and having them monitor water quality and flow. And if they know where it is, they go in here, they click the button, and then they know the watershed that's contributing to that monitoring station very nice and quickly. Um, again, it spits out the same basic information. I should say it's giving a land, land cover output at this point. Um, the green bars, deciduous forest, yellows, hay, pasture, for example. But you can also just click on these other tabs here and you'd see the soil types. Um, you'd see the animals that are estimated to be present, any point sources that are present in the area you've selected, and also some basic water quality parameters um, in terms of loading coming out of that particular area during a year. So let's zoom back into Potsdam now. Potsdam's at the base of this watershed. I just decided randomly to, that we're gonna talk about Manitani Creek today. It's a Huck 10, um, nice medium-sized watershed. And again, I selected that. Immediately it tells me the land cover distribution. The brown is cultivated crops, if you're curious. Um, all the pinks and reds are developed urban land use categories of one type or another. The redder the color, the more dense the urban development. And these, are, these correspond with the United States National Land Cover Database color coding. So they exactly match um, those, that national data set that it's drawing from. So let's go through and, sh and show you a couple of the functionalities here. So all I did here is I went from the land tab to the water quality tab to find out what's going on in the Manitani Creek 
And what it's pulling here is a separate model called SRAT, the Stream Reach Assessment Tool, which again was developed using William Penn Foundation money for the Delaware River Basin only. And what that does is it breaks Manitoti Creek watershed into a bunch of smaller micro watersheds and analyzes them for the potential to deliver different pollutants. And again, that's based largely on land cover um, present in the watershed. And so you can see here the darker ones mean that they're delivering more of a pollutant load than the lighter colored ones. Okay. And again, this is just a first level kind of look at the watershed. You can also click on that point sources tab and it's showing me here, it's listing the individual point sources, including the National Pollution, uh, National Pollution Discharge Elimination. Yeah. Elimination System, yes, code. So you can look this up and find a lot more information about it if you want to, but we have the basics here of where it's located, what the discharge is permitted. Um, so for example, total nitrogen load in kilograms per year is permitted, 5.64 kilograms per, per permitted for that first point source. And I've selected it, um, again on that little dot Wi-Fi like symbol here, I've selected EPA permitted point sources and it's poof, shows up overlaid on the map. Yes? So were those for instance wastewater treatment plants? They could be wastewater treatment plants, they could be corporations that are manufacturing oriented and have discharges. They could also be um, intense agricultural operations of one kind or another. Um, but most often they are some sort of water treatment facility, yeah. Yes? How, how dynamic is the data? Like how often are those permits updated? So the model directly accesses these data sets at the origin. So as soon as they're updated by the EPA, it's updated here. The same with the National Land Cover data set. It's live, basically. Some of them are updated more frequently than others, like the NLCDs every 10 years. Um, I don't actually know how often the EPA updates its point source permit. But it's by state. By state, so. You can also click on the dots if you're not sure what's what, and it again gives you the code, it gives you the type and the total nitrogen and um, sediment or phosphorus or whatever the permitted load is, and the code over there, and you can match it to the table if you want. And again, you can, all these data tables that are showing up on the left, there's always a download this data button. Click that, poof, it's in an Excel file. It opens up on your computer automatically. Save it, good to go, right? Again, it makes accessing this kind of data very easy, whereas otherwise it is very hard <laughs> to go looking around at all these different agency websites to try to find this information out. Can't even visualize half of it unless you're operating in ArcGIS. Uh, which is another expensive program that most people don't have sitting on their laptops at home. Um, so all I showed you before, we haven't even done any modeling yet. We've just selected an area and you're already given all this information. It's, it's preparing you um, to understand your watershed and then you can actually select a model to work with the watershed area and again start to manipulate the watershed as if you were making management decisions in that watershed. So when you select a, hit the select a model button at the bottom, you get two options. And it says choose one of two models to simulate stormwater runoff and water quality. Again, that site storm model is the simple one. It's a 24 hour period, one storm event. You can tell it how big of a storm you want. It can be a little drizzler or it can be a hurricane scale, you know, 10 inches over 24 hours. Um, it's based, on, again, on a series of models that are separate, different than the MapShed model, which is the underpinning for the Watershed Multi-Year model. So we would select the Watershed Multi-Year model for today's talk. And <coughs> things don't change a whole lot in terms of the visualization. It just now knows what model you're going to be running. Um, you could, I've selected here the National Land Cover Database so we can see how land cover varies in the Manitoni River watershed. Um, it's still giving the same bar graph, but now we have the colors on the map to match up to those land cover types. And again, you could do the same thing with the soils. If you chose soils here, you get a table for soils. And then if you clicked on the hydrologic soil group from Sergo, Sergo is the national soil type data set basically, the map would change and show you the soils data set. Um, 
So let me go back. Let me go back. There we go. So this is in the Analyze tab up here. Once I selected a model, you now have Analyze or Model options that show up. So Analyze is still kind of like Learn by your watershed. You still got the same type of information over here. When you click over to the Model tab, now it's running that multi-year watershed model in the background. And it's spinning out a lot more detailed information. It's run 30 years of precipitation data as a simulation through the all the different layers present here, the land cover, the soils, the slopes, et cetera, and it's produced an, an estimated yearly behavior for this watershed. And so what you're looking at here is precipitation. <coughs> it's a plot of precipitation from June through December. So we get most of our precipitation in spring, no big surprise there. Storms in the summer, dropping off, et cetera. Again, this is an average modeled estimate for this area based on the last 30 years in this area, okay? You can overlay the stream network again just by highlighting it so you can see. Um, and again, I should mention this is a high resolution stream layer that was developed specifically for the Delaware River Basin. It's better than what's available for the rest of the United States. Uh, but if you're outside the DRB, no big deal. You just look at the national layer and you don't get as fine an, an idea of the flow pass, but you get a good idea of the flow pass. I've selected here, there's again just a drop me down menu, I've switched from precipitation to stream flow. And again, it's telling you the stream flow patterns for Manitoni Creek watershed. Again, no surprise, spring is our high flow period, drops down to very low flow during the summertime and then climbs back up as we move into winter. All right, I should say that the numbers that are produced here on the plot you can't read from the back. Stream flow, 5.46 centimeters. So that means for May, on average, there's about 5.46 centimeters of stream flow generated all over the watershed. So you take 5.46, multiply that, that by the watershed area, and you'd get the total volume of water delivered as stream flow off the watershed. And those um, those total numbers are available further down off the screen here. There's a bar here. You just pull that down and you can see at the bottom the totals um, as well as the monthly breakdown. Um, here's a, an image showing the soil group overlaid. Um, these are hydrologic soil groups. It's not the specific soil type. Um, so you might have heard of, you know, the so-and-so loam. Yes, that's a specific soil type. But what really matters in terms of a hydrology is how much sand versus clay is in that soil? And so the sandy soils allow lots of infiltration. They don't produce a lot of runoff. The more clay you get, the more runoff you get, and the less infiltration. And so the dark colored areas are where you have high clay concentrations, very poor soils for infiltration, and that you can target management to those areas of the watershed to, for example, get agriculture off of there and plant a forest <laughs> and try to control runoff production or um, do other BMPs to try to control the amount of water produced off of those parcels of land. So let's see what's next. Oh, here's a, uh, just a slide showing you the satellite imagery overlay. And again, it's kind of a little washed out in here. This is where I've got to turn the lights off. But you can see what's in the background now is a satellite image. And you can very clearly see the green, which is the forest patches, you see the stream network overlaid. Um, and what I've identified here now is the USGS National Information System, National Water Information System. And these kind of see-through circles are the location of USGS stream gauges. And there's one right at the base of Mantani Creek there. So if you want to know about the history at a particular gauge, all you do is click on that circle and it tells you what the U.S. gauge identification number is, when it was last updated. Some of them are alive today and, and maintained. Some of them went offline, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. You can still look at the old data. It's just not current. There's no current data. But if you want to look at that particular gauge, you can click on the historical data button. And another graph shows up, um, and this is a dynamic graph. At the bottom here, you can see only a very narrow portion is selected, um, showing the last 
a uh, week to 10 days, basically, showing the river discharge, um, but you can change this to river height or river stage over that time period. And if you were interested in a longer time period, you just make that box bigger and it expands out. And again, this is pulling directly from the United States Geological Survey website, okay, which is a bear to get through. Uh, this is what I work with all the time. And this is so much easier <laughs> to look at the historical data. You can't download this data, though. To get the actual raw data on stream flow, you do have to go to the USGS website. But nevertheless, you can look very quickly and very easily. Um, okay, so back to the model. I've switched off the USGS layer, the National Land Cover Database is back, and I've taken um, the Hydrology tab off and clicked onto the Water Quality tab now. And this is to show you the much greater detail that you get once you're in the model mode as opposed to the analyze mode. It's broken, broken this down by land cover type. So for hay pasture, it tells you how much sediment is yielded off of this watershed over a given year, how much total nitrogen, and how much total phosphorus. So this is that weighting model, the GWLFE model, tacking the pollutant load onto the water that's produced. And again, at the bottom, if you scroll down to the bottom on this side, you would get the total loads delivered off the watershed over a given year. So it's breaking it down. Wetlands, woods, open land, barren areas, low density development, high density development, et cetera. Um, now it's the point where we can start gaming the watershed, and I'll show you how you can manipulate by suggesting different best management practices. So to do that, you go over onto the right side where that red circle showed up. There's a button there that says add changes to this area. And once you click on that, a drop-down menu appears, and these are all the BMPs that are available in MapShed's model that have now been brought into Model My Watershed to apply to your area of interest. So there's two categories. There's a rural category, which are agricultural BMPs, and then an urban category. And again, they differ. Um, the one that's uh, selected there is cover crops. So um, that's a, 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 the latest and greatest agricultural BMPs is to try to get farmers to have something growing in their field all year, not just during the main crop season but once they pull off the corn and soybeans, they put a cover crop in that grows over the winter, keeps the nutrients in the soil there, keeps the soil in place, and then they either plow that in or plant right into it in the spring for their main crop of corn or beans again, okay? Um, there's a whole bunch of options there. As you select one, an explanatory box opens that explains what a cover crop is. So same thing, conservation tillage, what is it? You click on it and you get a description. It's the practice of leaving plant residue in the fields after you harvest, not having a bare soil, but having something that's covered with plant residue. Nutrient management, not applying nitrogen you don't need to apply to the farm. Um, livestock waste management, that's you know building a state-of-the-art manure lagoon instead of having a, a cesspool that's leaking nitrogen like crazy. Is, is that is that based on um, the areas that are currently being farmed? And, yes. And is it updated on a regular basis? So it's updated as often as the NLCD land cover data set is. So it's, this is all based on the land cover categories you see here. So, um, I believe, okay, so if I selected cover crops, what it's going to do is it's going to my little drop-down demonstration didn't show up. Well, what you would do is you'd select cover crops from that menu right here. And another little window opens up, and it says um, 3,400 acres available. So there's 3,400 acres in this watershed in, cover, in row crops. And it then asks you, how many of those acres do you want to put into this PMP? So if your goal, um, if you're writing a proposal to get money to go out and talk to farmers and convince every farmer in your watershed to convert to 24-7 cover cropping, you can put in, okay, I want all 3,000 acres to go into cover crops and tell me how much sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen that reduces coming off the, the watershed. Yeah. So if you were to select uh, like stream bank stabilization yes. there on the one before, yeah. um, 
that obviously to me would be like linear feet yep. along the, the strings that are in there. Yep. So is it going to give you like a total of linear feet and then you yep. estimate like if we stabilize 10%? Exactly. Okay. Exactly right. Or if you have a project area that you know is 1,537 feet long, you can put that in there and it'll, it'll explain to you what that net effect is going to be. And it might be tiny, <laughs> but in the big picture, you know, you're dealing with a large watershed and it's, it's a realistic estimate of the impact of the BMP. Yes. Any other questions about, yeah. Uh, maybe it's the question of what's the, uh, embedded in the, the, the original map shed loading function on uh, stream bank erosion. Yeah. Is that sensitive to the like the setting of the stream itself? Obviously, looking at like the Manitoni or something that may be in some like very deep legacy like, yeah. sediment versus something, say in Potter County. Right. And I, that's probably a, yeah. This is maybe Barry Evans' question. Yeah. Well, Barry and I talk about this all the time. This is the one in in every watershed model that produces sediment and nutrient loads. Bank erosion is the big black box. We know how much banks there are. We can measure the linear foot availability of banks. But what happens is we model the watershed surface and we use uh, equations like the Russell soil loss equation to estimate how much sediment's coming off a farm field. And then we get the total load that we predict coming out of the watershed just based on soil and hill slope erosion. And usually that's a lot lower than the actual load that's coming out of a watershed. And what happens with all these models is we say, well, the rest must be coming from stream bank erosion. And so it's all assigned to stream bank erosion because there's nowhere else to put it, right? And so a caveat for this in every watershed model is that stream bank erosion is often vastly overestimated as a source. It is a source, particularly if you're flowing through three meters of legacy um, dam reservoir sediment. Or if you have a dairy farm where the cows are in the stream, you are generating massive loads of stream bank erosion. But it can't possibly all come from that because if you do the, net, the math and assign all that, bank ero that extra sediment to the banks, the rivers would be like 300 yeah. meters yeah. wide, you know, and they're not. And so what, realistically what's happening is the erosion off of hill slope surfaces is underestimated. And so it's just all dumped in that black box of stream bank erosion. Yeah. Yep. Um, another question, if you were modeling, um, let's say putting in riparian buffers. Yes. You would use the vegetated buffer strip? Yes, although this is, a, it's not referencing a forested buffer, it's referencing a grass buffer. And so this is one area we're working with Barry to develop a new BMP. So you can differentiate a forested riparian buffer from a grass buffer. Like turf grass or maybe? Yeah, like the typical, it's usually a pasture grass that um, they can hay off. And Even collect. under urban? Oh, under urban, no. That's a, that's a whole different, um, the vegetated buffer strips under urban is usually a mix of vegetation types. And does the model assume what kind of width? Like a 50 foot buffer, a 100 foot buffer? It does make an assumption. It, in the original map sheds model, you can adjust the width, but here I believe it's estimating a 25 foot buffer width. Yes. Does it say that in, like, what I, if I clicked on vegetated buffer? Would it it say does that? not, because okay. we're trying our best to get that to be customizable as quickly as possible. Okay. <laughs> so okay. the less we have to go back and edit, the more money we save. Okay, great. Yes. Um, with the move to Wiki Watershed, do you think we're always going to be able to like, export that GMS? And yes. manipulate it and yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, um, it's actually disappeared up here, but when you're in the analyze mode, there's a little option up here that says export GMS file. And that you can then export and open up in the desktop map sheds program and customize it and do these extra things. So can you explain now how, once you've done all this modeling, mm -hmm. how you would save it so you can go back and access that later on, and then yes. also how to pre, like, how you would extract things to present? Yes. So up here it says untitled project, because I was just doing this this morning to customize it to Potsdam, but I could have saved, you just click on this and it says save file, name file, so you name it. Every time you logged in, and the first time you access it, you do have to log in and create a login. It's there. 
Okay, so your projects are saved. So you could do one for Manitoni Creek, you could do one for another, another area, you could do one for Manitoni that just focused on ag BMPs, another one that focused on urban BMPs. You can do as many projects as you want. To export the information, again, at the bottom of this, these tables on the left, there's always a download data button. And so you do have to do it by type of information, um, but those are then exported to an Excel file that you can then save on your computer. What do you mean by type of information? So for here, uh, for example, we're looking at the hydrology tab, and so it's reporting out the hydrology data for this watershed. So if I click the download data button, it's going to give me all of these numbers in this table as an Excel sheet. For that project? For this project, for so this site. So you might site. have to download multiple things for one project? Yes. Okay. Yes, you would. Yep. Other questions? Okay. I've got about 10 more slides, and then I can do some of this live to hopefully um, help you see this. So what I've done here is I've scrolled down. Um, at the bottom now, I'm on the water quality visual. Here you can download this data. That's going to give you this data table. Here's a summary table for the annual yields coming out of this watershed. So total loads of sediment, of nitrogen, of phosphorus. You can download this data, and it's going to give me this data table. So it is data table specific to download. You can't just click a button and download everything all at once. Okay. Um, but this is where you can start to really see the net effect of a particular BMP that you've instigated. You can look at, um, if you're interested in low flow concentration of sediment, that's the number you keep an eye on. If you're looking at total load, uh, annual load, uh, which is like for a TMDL issue, um, it's usually that top layer there, the total load button, um, row. So with our cover crop implementation, for example, um, we t you know, go from a watershed with no BMPs, um, and we can watch how these numbers change. Okay, they don't change a whole lot, but they do change somewhat in the terms of like two, mil two million kilograms of sediment less. Okay, is it still a lot of sediment? Absolutely, but have you taken a significant chunk out of the problem? Sure, sure did. And it's a relatively easy thing to convince farmers to do because there's benefits to the farmer of planting those cover crops um, that are not associated with water quality at all. You could again, you know, see what happens as you add on those different BMPs. What if it's just cover crops? What if it's cover crops plus getting the livestock out of the streams, plus um, doing uh, cultivation, uh, uh, conservation cropping with the plant residue, plus um, planting veg vegetative buffer strips next to the streams as opposed to farming right up the stream channel, and you can look at the total effect there. You can also look at the urban BMPs, uh, and again, one of the data layers that's new that we've added to this is the PA urbanized area layer. So I've overlaid that now. The gray splotches are classified as urban. And these are the areas that, for example, are going to fall under your MS4 permitting regulations. H densely developed areas. And you can apply those urban BMPs to those areas um, and see what happens, for example, to the hydrology. Usually these are not big water quality sources. We're talking about stormwater runoff primarily as a problem. So you flick over to the hydrology tab, look at the total um, surface runoff number, for example, which is 7.6 here with no BMPs. And if I say you take all of that urban area and somehow get infiltration and bioretention swales installed to handle that runoff, what does that do? Um, it lowers it to 5.7. Okay, so there is a reduction. It's not a hopeless uh, cause. It's not going to eliminate the problem, but it does reduce the problem. Uh, this board is stuck. There we go. Okay, so that's where we're at today. Um, in the future, future plans, um, we were wanting to add stream network analysis outputs because a lot of folks want to know um, things like how many stream miles in their watershed are first order streams versus second order streams versus third order streams. So what counts as a tributary versus not a tributary. Um, we want to fully integrate that the, the, the power behind the map shed model in terms of customizing things. Like I said, the number of sheep, um, the number of um, confined animal feeding operations, those kinds of things. So you can, we can bring in that full power of map sheds. We've got about 75% of the capability of map sheds in here now, and we want to finish with that rest of the 25%. And we're always looking to add new GIS layers that will help increase the precision of our model outputs. So for example, cropland, 
um, tells you not just what's in agriculture versus forest versus et cetera, but what's in corn and soybeans versus vegetable cropping versus other um, things that have very different pollutant loads typically that come off of them. How does that get updated? Um, the specific process of getting the layer into the model, or? No, no, like if, you know, soybeans versus row crops. Or right, so the USDA does um, aerial flights in the United States every two years. And they, using, you know, sort of AI, artificial intelligence, identify what's happening on the ground. Because they want to know how much production to expect uh, from the country. So it, it's every two years, essentially. But this isn't integrated yet, but this is the plan um, to get really kind of zero in and really refine those estimates of the pollutant loads and the water loads coming off the land. And, 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 come on, one more. There we go, last slide. <laughs> uh, again, the black cards, both of these tables <coughs> have these websites. This takes you to our Wiki Watershed Portal. You can play around with the other tools, too. Some of them are really easy and cool to deal with as well. Um, this takes you directly to the Model My Watershed app. Um, and if you're interested in MapShed, the core model that's behind Model My Watershed multi-year model, you can go straight to that as well. But again, this has got a limited lifespan on it. Um, and that's it. So if you want me to run through anything live, I can. We've got about five, six minutes left. But yeah. I have two questions. Sure. One, when you're discussing water quality, yes, you are only discussing surface water quality. Yes. Okay. This does not involve groundwater, unfortunately. Does it consider uh, inputs from groundwater or, or deletions well, from the groundwater? Well, the hydrology certainly does. So we use the base flow contribution data from USGS to, to help calculate okay. stream flow. Um, and in terms of the water quality constituents, some of that does include the base flow contribution. So for example, nitrogen, uh, the groundwater around here is typically pretty high nitrogen concentration as a legacy from over application in the 80s during the corn boom with ethanol. So we're still draining that legacy nitrogen out. Um, and so that, that goes into the estimates because a lot of this is just a giant regression between sampled water quality and land cover in a watershed from millions of data points at this point. And so those, those are what are used to estimate the loading. So they're, they're in there, but they're very deep in, the, in those estimates. And second question, yep. uh, when you talk about pollutants or contaminants, from what I can tell, you're only discussing sediment, nitrogen. phosphorus, and nitrogen. You don't care about anything else. Well, we care about it, but we can't model it yet. Okay. Yes. So if I you know, discharge a bunch of produced frack water, I can't model what impact that may have. Right, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Not with this model anyway. Yes? Do, do you have layers in there that show um, stream segments that are impaired or like TMDL segments? We don't, but the SRAT model is one of the visualization layers that showed all those micro watersheds that are shaded, you know, sort of on varying degrees of production of pollutants. You can also look at a version of that that's the stream reaches that become highlighted as source reaches of, for, and it's broken down by sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen again. But no, we don't have, for example, the, the state of Pennsylvania stream layer that has, you know, the different quality ratings on it. Other questions? Yeah. No. From this school kill, do you have mine runoff? Yeah, there is, but it's not included in this model. I don't consider yeah. I don't. I didn't look at that actually. I didn't look at the point layer for the whole Schuylkill watershed. I just looked for Mantani Creek, uh, but it might be there. Could be there for the Schuylkill. Yes. Can you take a flow reduction? output and work backwards to get a um, list, a prioritized list of DMDs by some sure. criteria? Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one of the ways this is being used the most, is for folks to look at a watershed and figure out where they get the biggest bang for their buck. So if you're interested in flow reduction or nitrogen reduction or phosphor reduction, phosphorus reduction, 
you could sit there and say, okay, is cover cropping the most effective way to do it, or is it um, infiltration basins going to give me the most flow reduction? And again, it, it does take some time. You've got to run through and look at the number that's produced in the table. Um, but you can, you can download that data. You can make a graph showing the different reductions you can get from all the different BMPs or combinations of BMPs. Yep. Would the state be like one of those um, opportunity test candidates for something to measure how many riparian projects that they can work on? A riparian buffer tree planting opportunity, we've all said it's not enough money. Mm -hmm. So it would be really neat if they could use this and model like what is the biggest case scenario they'd have to fund and then based on how many of us are going after applications, what's a realistic dollar that they could put forth to the right. governor right. Or, or to the taxpayers. But this seems like it would be a really cool model to prove all of our case. You're not offering enough money for this really important. Yes. Yeah. And they could, they could do that. And again, they do it really cheaply as opposed to having the GIS shop at the yeah. state spend months of salary time yep. cranking the data to generate the same answer that yep. this can give you. Absolutely. Yeah. So from your urban <coughs> surface water retention, but you don't have that through Laurel. So if you want to do a swale, yeah. how would you put that in? So unfortunately, there is kind of limited um, BMP options. I'm going to go to the model here so we can explore <coughs> some of the ones I didn't screen capture. Um, so we'll go to Wiston Hicken Creek this time. So this, this is the analysis time I mentioned. So if I wanted to add changes to this area, and I was interested in a, like an urban stormwater pond, yeah. for example, that would classify as something like the surface water retention choice here. So you could put that anywhere, or just? You could put it anywhere, and yeah. But it's not a spatially explicit model, so you, you don't draw on the map where the pond <coughs> is going. You, you have to know, okay, so I'm going to put in a three-acre stormwater pond. And then you go to this and you say, okay, surface water retention, and it's going to be, um, oh, and these are in hectares, three hectares. And then that applies that to your watershed surface. But the position doesn't matter. Okay, this, this is not a spatially explicit hydrology model. So it's not routing water over the ground in a linear fashion downstream. It's again taking those chunks of land types, saying, okay, we have 50 hectares of, of high density urban development that produces this much water with this nutrient pollutant load. We're going to take three hectares of that and make a stormwater pond that treats, and embedded in this is um, a treatment capability. So you have your three hectares of pond area, and that treats X hectares of urban development it can absorb the runoff from a certain area. And that's, those numbers are all based on stormwater engineering design specs for these types of structures. So like where I have there, you know, so if we right. want to put a swale there, yep. then I really couldn't, I can't specifically say that field. I Not unless you delineate the field as your area of interest. Sorry. So if you, if you zoom way in and, you, and say, okay, here's my field, and here's the area where I'm gonna build the swale, then you've got a much smaller land surface you're dealing with. It's going to model specifically that field. And you'll get a much closer idea of what that infiltration berm is going to do. Yeah. But not every BMP is in here. So sometimes we're kind of like <coughs> guessing. So for example, the Stroud Center has put in a whole bunch of infiltration berms at the base of ag fields as part of a watershed yeah. restoration project. But you know, there's nothing in here in the rural category to show that, yeah. <laughs> right? And so this is one of the limitations of the model that we're trying to work on. We're trying to work with Barry to develop new BMP options that provide that full suite to the user. So and if I'm going to go to my township and say, hey, if we put swales in for this ground that you guys own, right. I really can't show them the, the difference on that. I, 
not in the multi-year watershed model. Oddly enough, the oh, site storm model, so this, yes, that one does have uh, more BMP options. Yeah. Yes. Um, this seems to be set up to, to allow you to kind of um, see what the possible impacts of different BMPs may be. What about going the other direction? I want to turn uh, so many acres of old growth forest into farmland, or I want to turn so much farmland into residential development. Yes. Can I mess with ground, with land use as well? In the multi-year watershed model, not yet, but that's part of that last step of, of bringing the full functionality of map sheds in here so you can change the acreage of land cover types. Okay. But in the site storm model, you just said that you I can, mistake. yeah. Okay, you, I'm it's sorry. the same thing, but it's the BMPs. But you can also change the land cover types in okay. the site storm model. So you don't get the whole year analysis. You don't get the annual load data, which is what regulators want to see. But you do. You can simulate a 24-hour storm event and show the impact would be of changing 400 acres of farmland into forest. Yeah. These are great questions. You guys are going to be high-end users, I can tell. <laughs> We're going to crash your system. Today. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> it's all run off the Amazon cloud. You can't crash it. <laughs> Any other questions? OK. Like I said, business cards. Um, we also have a question portal there. If you get stuck, you just submit a question. And we <coughs> there's seven or eight of us that answer. We troubleshoot all the time with random user questions as they come in. Okay. And it's free, no cost to the user.